When people ask me where I'm from, I say I'm from Texas. Now you can imagine the look of puzzlement that I get on some faces when little old South Asian me claims to be from cowboy country. But Texas is a lot more diverse than one might think, at least in metropolitan areas. In fact, when I used to live in Texas, I used to only have to drive two blocks to get to a halal meat store or an ethnic clothing store or an ethnic salon. However, when I moved to Minnesota, that was not the case. I quickly realized that there is a, a very big lack of ethnic businesses. And this drove me to think about how societies become inclusive. Now, as Minnesotans, we love talking about diversity, equity, and inclusion. We even have cutesy acronyms like DEI, or my favorite, DIE, like people will die talking about racial inclusion, right? But the truth is that these words actually have very distinct meanings. So diversity means making, accounting people, right? So literally, for the purposes of tonight's talk, counting the number of folks that you have that are racially different. Inclusion means making people count. So thinking about how their input is used in decision making. And equity is what we want, it's the outcomes of that work, right? So this evening, I'm gonna be focusing in on what it means to be more inclusive. And the first thing that we um, need to realize is that there are examples, shining beacons in our history, if you will, that we can look to to see examples of an inclusive society that we can emulate. And one of these examples for me was Cordoba, Spain, so imagine the year is 1000, and we're in the drawing room of a palace in Cordoba. Now, at this time, Cordoba was a beacon of learning. It was the leading economic cultural center in Europe at its time. And it, it was really at its peak. And it was in this context that people could find Muslim, Christian, Jewish scholars working together to translate canonical works and philosophy from Greek to Arabic and a matter, a manner of all other languages. Because this was a place where people from all over the globe came to work together to solve problems. These were people from Spanish descent, from Moroccan descent, from mixed descent, people from as far as Persia and Rome. And when these people came together from different belief sets and values and worked together to exchange knowledge, this produced a period of great innovation. And we saw advances in the fields of astronomy, mathematics, all matter of sciences, even linguistics and philosophy that form the backbone of human progress today. Now, the, in, the diversity of this era was critical to the innovations that occurred within it. In fact, scholars write about medieval Spain that cultural boundaries were permeable, and this led to Ha preventing people from having too rigid thinking. Even if you look beyond historical examples, modern research from the field of business shows us that diversity in teams is more effective for business, right? So McKinsey produced a report that talked about how the top quartile of companies and ethnic diversity at the executive level are 33% more likely to be profitable than companies in the bottom quartile. And even Harvard Business Review put out some research that indicates that diverse teams make more effective business decisions. So why is this the case? Well, some of the research points to the fact that diverse teams constantly re-examine facts and are able to remain objective. There's also some research that points to the fact that diverse teams process information differently that they need to make business decisions, right? So you have, again, one viewpoint prevented from becoming the norm, and there's a space where ideas are constantly refined and challenged. Do you see a pattern? So really, we haven't been able to use our diversity and tap into it to the extent that we can in order to make our societies better, right? And we know this. Data shows us decade over decade that inequities exist among people of color and white people when it comes to poverty, educational attainment, home ownership, even health, right? And these inequities lead to an unequal playing field. And we see this all across our sectors, right? And it, whether it's business, government, or private sector, um, leadership in all these sectors remains largely white and largely male. Now, just to be clear, um, my thesis of, the talk, of my talk this evening is not that being white or being male is a bad thing. What is bad is structural inequities and policies that lead to um, systems that don't work for people from non-dominant cultures. So what does this mean? Let me unpack that a little here. So 
Whether we like it or not, we are all operating within systems that are created primarily by and primarily benefit people from the dominant culture. So what do I mean when I say systems? Well, we can think of many different kinds of systems, right? Like the housing system, the healthcare system, the school system, even food systems, right? And food access. Um, we're surrounded by systems. And so the question becomes, what tools and resources do we have at our disposal in order to create more inclusive systems that work for everyone? And I argue that the first tool that we have is really self-awareness. So each one of us comes from a culture. And it's important for us to understand what that culture is and how it relates to the systems that we sit in. So for example, if you're a white student, how might the fact that you have mainly white teachers and administrators make your school experience different from that of a student of color? The more that we're able to figure out our own culture and how it relates to systems, the more we have the ability to gain a skill called cultural agility. And cultural agility is really all about how we deal with difference, right? Do we balk at difference? Do we deny that it exists? Do we minimize it? Do we accept it? Or do we work to adapt across difference? Now, some people might say, well, I don't really care for difference. Even if I see it, I work hard to make sure everyone is treated just the same. But the reality is that we've been socialized and are hardwired to prefer people similar to ourselves and that have similar preferences to ours. So how do we manage our biases, right? We know that we have them, and research has long pointed to the use of heuristics, stereotypes, narratives about other communities, and how that becomes so ingrained in our decision making. So I offer that in order to start managing our biases, we need to first gain that self-awareness and understand what culture we come from, as well as how we deal with difference. And then once we have that knowledge, let's put it into action. And here's where I challenge every one of us to think of ourselves as designers of micro systems or sets of decisions that come together to form larger systems. So each one of us in our personal and professional capacities, we make decisions that impact others. So the next time you're planning that meeting or designing that event, or you're about to launch the new product or that new program, we have questions that we can ask ourselves in order to design more inclusively. And these questions include the following. Who is impacted by the work? Who is represented at the table? And how is others' input needed to do the work well? So say, for example, you're a student and you're running for student council or you're creating the next community service event and designing it and planning for it. How might you begin to apply these questions? How they apply in each different context will look a little different, right? Take another example at the Minnesota State Fair. So the State Fair decided that they would have a prayer tent, right? Um, in order to accommodate for people who need to observe daily prayers. Now this, of course, includes Minnesota Muslims. So you had to have somebody, and I don't know the details of how this happened, but I'm guessing that somebody had to ask, who are people impacted? So thinking of perhaps Muslim Minnesotans, as well as others that need to observe daily prayers. And then thinking about who is represented at the table, and if there wasn't anybody at the table at the decision making of how the state fair would be, layout would be, they had to include the input of those people in order to understand how to design a prayer tent that would meet the needs of the people to have on the state fair grounds, right? By way of a final example, so I'm a program officer at the Bush Foundation, and we fund work all across our funding region. Burma is not our <laughs> funding region, but we one of the the organizations that we fund is a clinic within the the health the Health East and Fairview system called the Roselawn Clinic. And the Roselawn Clinic sees a subset of patients that identify as being ethnically Karen. Now, Karen people come from southeastern Burma, and these patients, clinic staff noticed that they were disproportionately impacted by alcohol addiction. So they decided to equitably design, right, or inclusively design, and they asked the three questions, and they formed what's called the Karen Chemical Dependency Collaborative. So they asked who is impacted by the issue, and in this case, they wanted to make a culturally responsive treatment for Karen patients facing alcohol addiction. They then asked who's represented at the table, and project leadership included people from within the Karen community who are working on health and wellness issues, as well as clinic staff and administrators. And then finally, they asked how is input needed to do this work well? And they used the input of both Karen and non-Karen leaders in order to create a um, system where Karen patients had, had the tools that they needed to have more healthy behaviors, and the clinic 
had to adapt its practices in order to be more culturally relevant for current patients suffering from addiction, right? So these are just a few examples. And the fact is that our team sees many organizations from across our region trying to grapple with their rapidly diversifying communities and how to be more inclusive of that diversity. In fact, in Minnesota, from 2010 to 2017, the population of people of color grew by 25%. And the population of people of color is expected to be 25% of the state's population by 2035. So it's up to us how we want to manage this increase in diversity or difference. Do we want to leave things the way uh, that they are and perhaps let inequities persist if not get worse? Or do we want to create more inclusive communities that really bring together the best of what everyone has to the table to create a beautiful mosaic that makes it better for everybody. Thank you.